Hi everyone, I'm Ed Baker. Welcome to the Addiction Recovery Channel, or ARC. I couldn't be more excited than I am today to celebrate recovery. September is Recovery Month, and that is the theme of our show. And in order to help us celebrate recovery, we have two distinguished guests. We have Gary DeCarolis, who is the executive director at the Chittenden County Turning Point, and we have Laura Charbonneau, who is a founding member of the Step Into Action Recovery Walk, which we'll hear a lot about later. Thank you both so much for Good being day, on the show. Yep. Thank you, Ed. Yeah. I thought, you know, I, I, think it's, um, I think it's a good idea to start with a working definition of this word, recovery. People use the word a lot. People hear the word a lot. What, what is recovery? What is recovery from addiction, mm -hmm. recovery from substance use disorder? <clears throat> this is the accepted uh, definition by the Substance Use and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. Recovering is a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life, and strive to reach their full potential. Now, that's general in nature, and SAMHSA goes on to describe what they call four major dimensions of recovery. And basically, this show will be digging down into each of these four dimensions. So I'll read you the definition of the first dimension of recovery is health. Overcoming or managing one's diseases or symptoms, for example, Abstaining from use of alcohol, illicit drugs, and non-prescribed medications if one has an addiction problem. And for everyone in recovery, making informed, healthy choices that support physical and emotional well-being. So let's start with that. What are your thoughts about that particular category, health? <clears throat> well, so first of all, um, when you think of someone coming perhaps from years of, of an addiction, active addiction, to, um, to recovery, that word process early on in the definition from Samson made ultimate sense to me because it is a process. It's not a, okay, I'm over here and now I'm over here. It, it, it's a process. Change in any respect takes time. And so health to me is a cornerstone of moving into recovery. Mm. Um, people's bodies have taken a beating. Um, you know, we found that one of the three highest comorbid issues that people deal with, for example, is oral health. Okay. Um, and so, you know, people aren't flossing and brushing their teeth necessarily the way you would, you might think. So it's, uh, it's you know, take an inventory of my body, of my physical health. Um, you know, taking classes in yoga and um, meditation and some of the things that help restore health to one's body is critically important. Yeah, yeah well said. <clears throat> well said, Gary. You know, and SAMHSA seems to um, recognize that pretty explicitly. This, mm -hmm. The definition of health seems to be broken down into two distinct phases. One is the achieving of, of what they call abstinence. Mm -hmm. And then the second is for people in what they call recovery, um, making informed, healthy choices that support physical and emotional well-being. Exactly. What, what, are, what are your uh, observations of that? I agree with a lot of what Gary just shared, and it really made me think about, you know, being a person in recovery. Hmm. What started the journey for me was seeking help with my health, you know, calling up a treatment center who was staffed by doctors who were able to help me get there. Um, who were able to make sure, like Gary mentioned, that the, all the other areas of my health were addressed. So I like that it covers both sides of that, not mm -hmm. just you know the health of becoming abstinent, but then making healthy life choices as well. Right, right, and that again, that idea of process, mm -hmm. and really, really a never-ending 
quality of life improvement. Absolutely. Really a process that, that really, I mean, that's one of the exciting things about recovery. Yes. Is that you can do it for the rest of your life. Absolutely, yes. It's not a place that you arrive at and you've done it. That's a mistake if one thinks that you do that, no matter who you are. Um, the other thing that, that Health Peace touches on and that we know is that many people experience trauma, if not before they started using drugs or alcohol, yeah. during their active addiction. Yeah. And so that has to be dealt with early on. And that's where therapy or treatment program, as Laura yeah. said, yeah. becomes critically yeah. important. Um, if not dealt with, it could be the stumbling block to move forward. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think <clears throat> that uh, the recovery movement captures that idea with pathways to recovery. Mm -hmm. and that people have different pathways to recovery. Absolutely. Where one person may need psychotherapy, yep. another person may need physical therapy, some people may exactly. need both. Exactly. You know, um, again, that idea of uh, uh, process. Mm -hmm. I think that I have a quote from uh, William White. William White is one of the uh, chief architects of the recovery advocacy movement and he seems to capture this idea of recovery being in stages pretty accurately. He has three distinct stages. One is partial recovery. Mm -hmm. For partial recovery, <clears throat> he describes it as it reflects decreased severity and frequency of alcohol and other drug problems amongst persistent efforts to achieve recovery stability. So I'm sure that you see a lot of that at the recovery center. Mm -hmm. People in early recovery, not yet stable, with maybe continued use, but a sustained effort to achieve abstinence. Right. Do you care to speak to that a little uh, bit? So we have a lot, we have, um, excuse mm -hmm. me, uh, a lot of people that are very early on, they, you know, their health is not uh, fully addressed at this point. Issues of housing are very big for them. Uh, meaningful work hasn't even been looked at um, and so our job is to kind of take someone from where they're at offer them the various supports that we have in the center from uh, a peer support worker that's willing to sit down with them and help develop an action plan for them you know it goes back to that old saying if you don't know where you're going you'll probably end up somewhere else so we want people to think about what is their recovery path, mm -hmm. what's important for them mm -hmm. to help them grow in their recovery. And once they identify those things, then it's amazing how fast they move forward from yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the uh, importance of uh, support during that, yeah. that really tough time. Very really tough, tough time. time. Very tough. That first year is, is um, fragile. Um, and there's ups and downs. There's uh, old friends that are, might be still actively using, yeah. that's still part of their life. Yeah. There's, a, there's push and pulls that are all over the place. We have some people that come into the center at nine in the morning, stay to five at night, and don't move because they're afraid of what the streets could be like for them. Yeah. And so, um, and we say, fine, if that's, that's gonna be helpful to you and you're gonna feel safe, you stay in the center. You know, take a yoga class, uh, meet with some friends, and. And we see that, and over time, you know, they might grow in their recovery enough to say, okay, I need to venture out because I got to take care of this, that, and the other thing, and that's okay. And we're open every day of the year in part for that very reason. I was thinking about that on the way over to the studio today, that you are actually open 365 days a year. Yep. That is incredible. Yep. And there's no cost. Very important. No anyone. cost. That's right. So beautiful. Yep. It's beautiful. Thanks, Ed. William White, the second um, designation that he has, so partial recovery first, and then what he calls full recovery, where full recovery most often refers to abstinence or sobriety, uh, improved global health, which is that process that we're, that we're describing, and then repair of the person-community relationship or citizenship. Mm. So full recovery, the person is really no longer struggling with the recurrence of use, mm -hmm. but the more building, building on sobriety, on health, and on reinvolvement in the in the community. I think that the recovery walk um, does have a, a lot to say about that reinvolvement mm -hmm. in the community. Mm -hmm. So the step into action recovery walk was started exactly on that purpose. Yeah. Was mm -hmm. um, 
a group of women who spanned in sobriety of, I, I really think one month, even just <laughs> one month <laughs> to a year, a few years, um, who wanted to do something who wanted to give back to the Turning Point Center, mm -hmm. and not just the Turning Point Center, but the recovery mm -hmm. community in Burlington. Mm -hmm. And it gave us purpose. You know, we, I was joking around earlier um, with, we didn't really know what we were doing. <laughs> we definitely stumbled through a lot of that process, but we did it together. And in the end, there was something that we could show for it, and we were able to, you know, give back to the community yeah. that was yeah. helping us Great. put our lives back together. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that and then we can go into some of this other um, definition of recovery. What were you gonna say, Gary, I'm sorry. Well, I was gonna say one of the things, I remember the first walk and it was at Oak Ledge Park mm -hmm. and a number of family members of the women that organized it came to that event yeah. that day. Yeah. <clears throat> and it was, that was part of the, for them, it was part of their rebuilding their family connections mm -hmm. because they were women in early recovery and some of those family relationships get strained if not broken and in yeah. early recovery it's it is building those things back mm -hmm. and that takes time but i think by organizing the effort they're very proud of what they did and they had every right to be they, they started something from nothing and there was uh, i think at least 100 150 mm -hmm. people there that wow. day wow wow that's for the first walk yeah that's and amazing. so their families yeah. said you know mm -hmm. they could see a their enthusiasm b their achievement Mm -hmm. and the seriousness of what they took their recovery. Mm -hmm. And so they were there to celebrate with their daughters. It was quite, quite wonderful. That is, and it was all women at that point. It was all women. You know, yeah. the Oxford House is a part of a network that includes men. And in the beginning, some men helped out, but it was definitely the core of the, of the planning process and the energy definitely came from those women. Mm. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Now, the, the second definition in the SAMHSA definition is uh, home. Mm. So the importance of home, a stable and a safe place to be. Yeah. What was, you were a, a, a member of Oxford House. Do you want to describe that and what that meant to you? Yeah, um, you know, I am part of this community because of the Oxford House. Mm -hmm. I found myself in, in treatment in this area and had no idea where I was going to go after. And Gary had mentioned it, you know, the old people. And I actually lived in Burlington and it was part of a lot of my old people and places that contributed to my lifestyle before. And I found the Oxford House and I never would have imagined that I could have maintained recovery in this area. Mm -hmm. And what it gave me was, you know, essentially a family. Yeah. You know, it was yeah. a safe place that <clears throat> required um, abstinence, total abstinence. However, at the same time, I was learning to provide for myself again, um, to financially provide for myself, to take care of all parts of myself, my health, um, my sobriety, doing things that I needed to become part of this community again. Yeah. I mean, you, you couldn't describe this any better, any better than that. that. That is beautiful. You know, people, people who aren't in the field don't get the kind of information that, that we get. It's just part of life. Yeah. Um, and by and by, the general public thinks that if a person with addiction or a substance use disorder doesn't have a drug in their system, that all they have to do is now not mm -hmm. put a drug in their system again. But I think one of the things that, that we're speaking to now is this idea of brain disease. Mm -hmm. That if you have substance use disorder or addiction and you have no drugs in your system, that doesn't mean that you're, the functioning of your brain has healed. Exactly. So it's been mentioned a couple of times, people, places, and things, temptations, people trying to give you drugs. It's very, very dangerous until the brain begins to heal. Mm. Very, very dangerous phase Absolutely. of recovery. And that's where Oxford House 
uh, a safer envir environment, family, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. people to get to know, people to believe in you. Mm -hmm. The same thing with the recovery center. I'd like to put that slide up of the, um, the mural at the, um, at the recovery center. If you could put that, put that slide up just for one second, we can talk a little, a little bit about that. Yeah, because yeah. it, it really speaks to what we're talking about yeah. now in terms of yeah. home and how, and you know, when I've seen the, the most radical change from anyone early in recovery is when they go from being homeless to having a home. That just a sense of of place yeah. uh, is so important. I mean, the turning yeah. point tries to do that for folks, and we can get so far with that. But we do turn the lights out, and and people have to leave at some point. <clears throat> but a place that you can put your head on a pillow at night and know you're safe and, and secure, yeah, is <clears throat> so important. Yeah, um, and yeah. that's uh, I think that's what uh, sober housing does for folks, and and. Um, it makes it, it's another one of those foundational pieces as that definition talks about. Yeah. To the audience, uh, I mean, if you're, uh, if you can get by the recovery center, well, where, where, what street is the mural on? The mural's on King Street. And we're on the corner of South Winooski Avenue and King Street. The mural's on the King Street side. If you can get to the King Street side and, and, and take a look at that mural, you notice that right in the middle of the mural is a small frame and it says, Home, sweet home. Mm -hmm. And it, it couldn't be better said that, although people don't live there, of course, right. it's open 365 days a year. Right. And for many people, it's, it's a transition from homelessness mm -hmm. to like temporary home. It's, it's a, it's a place. place that feels yeah. like home. Yeah. Yep. There's family there, there's safety there. Yep. And there, by and large, other than this executive director and maybe one or two other people, everyone there is in recovery. All yeah. the staff are in recovery. Yeah. They've been where every guest is. Yeah. And so yeah. that's a very powerful connection that they make. And, they, and, they, and they, there's that, um, I think about it a lot. And I think one of the things that's very comfortable about a place like the Recovery Center or Oxford House, or 12-step meetings for that matter, mm -hmm. is that there is no stigma there. Mm -hmm. There is nothing pushing somebody away or pushing somebody down. Right. It's all, we understand, we've been there, yep. we accept you, you're important. Yep. It doesn't get much better than that. Yep. That's why people, I think, come back. Yep. And, and you have talents and gifts to give to the world, and we want to help you see those yeah. and then put them to use. Yeah, yeah, yep. the art room. <clears throat> yeah, the art room is a great place. Yeah. So we can, um, the third major dimension in the SEMPS uh, definition is purpose. And I know this is one of your favorite topics. <clears throat> they describe it as meaningful daily activities, <clears throat> such as a job, school, volunteerism, family caretaking, or creative endeavors, yeah. and the independence, income, and resources to participate in society. Again, that process. Absolutely. You want to speak a little bit about purpose, yeah, Gary? So, <clears throat> you know, I think, um, and this is where employment kind of straddles this area here, though. We all have gifts to give to the world. And, you know, part of our job is to help people realize they have those gifts. They may have forgotten about them or lost them somehow, mm -hmm. but they're there. Yeah. And then you want to take the extension of that is finding meaningful work, work that reflects those things about you that are special, that are your gifts to the world. Mm -hmm. And so we do have an employment consulting team in the center that will help you go from preparing a resume to interview skills to finding recovery friendly employers out there, yeah. you know, finding that work and then moving forward. And when, when that clicks in, um, so you, you talk about, we've talked about health, home, and purpose. Mm -hmm. You're on your way to a great life. Yeah, um, yeah. And so, and those are all, uh, those are all inoculations against addiction. Great way you to know? put it, yeah. yeah. Those, mm -hmm. those, those are, that's your recovery capital. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we want to help grow that capital. And we s can't tell you how many amazing people walk through our door. Yeah. When they first walk through the, the door. They don't think they're so amazing, but it doesn't take too long for them to catch the wave. <laughs> That's beautiful. Do you, do you remember that about, I know that you've been, 
You've been in recovery since the very beginning of the um, Step Into Action Recovery Walk. Mm -hmm. So do you remember when, when what Gary is talking about first began to occur for you? Well, you began to feel purpose. You began to feel meaning. You began to feel like you had something to offer. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and what I was thinking about when Gary was speaking was you stop, when you find that purpose, you stop identifying as somebody who is in, re in recovery, even though that's an important part of who mm -hmm. you are. But you, these other things start to define you so much that the only thing that I identify back to, to you know, that time when you're piecing mm. everything back together, you're looking for your purposes, that's, that's what has defined my character in yeah. a positive way. Yeah. Yeah. And that is when I felt the stigma drop away. Yeah. That yeah. I'm no longer someone hiding yeah. um, behind, you know, what I used to struggle and the challenges that I face, but I'm someone that has triumphed over it. And yeah. it's only made me who I am today in such more of a positive way than I would have ever imagined. Oh, so, so well said. Yeah, I <laughs> so remember the, Laura in that yeah. early committee work, she was the business person. She had the business head. So that, that, <laughs> it, that was one of her, that was her. And it was emerging real quick in that committee. Mm -hmm. so, That's great. Yeah. And, you're, and you're under the surface, hidden by symptoms of addiction. Exactly. When the symptoms are gone, the, you know, what, what's great begins to grow again. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> When you were saying that, a couple of things. One, one is that you felt the stigma drop away, which means that we, we, we with addiction, and I'm a, I'm a person with a history of addiction also, we, we internalize stigma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We feel shame. Yeah. We feel worthless. That's sad. And after a while of brain healing and a while of encouragement and a while of support, we begin to let that drop away mm -hmm. and we become the best we can be. I wanted to read uh, William White's third designation of um, recovery, and I think this describes you. He calls it enriched recovery, refers to a state of optimal health, functioning, and community service, rising not in spite of addiction, but because of the strengths of character developed through the addiction recovery process. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Do you feel that? I do. Yeah. And it's come in through a process, like mm -hmm. you know, we've been speaking about, and it has come organically through that process. You know, when you you talked about education, that is something that I'm pursuing now that I never thought I would pursue again. Professionally, you know, you know, family, yeah. giving back are all very big pieces to my life yeah. and they're always all present in my life. Yeah. And I never thought that I, that this is where it would come to. Yeah. So it surprises me in a lot of ways that, you know, I, what my expectation was and then what life is like today is very, they're very different things. It's complete, it's like a complete reorientation to, to reality. Mm -hmm. Really, really something. Mm -hmm. Now, the last um, uh, dimension of the SAMS, uh, definition is community. So we have health, home, purpose, and community. Community is defined as relationships, mm -hmm. social networks mm -hmm. that provide support, friendship, love, and hope. Wanna, would you like to address that a little bit? <clears throat> <clears throat> There's a couple of thoughts that quickly come to mind. Um, mm. 12-step programs um, uh, do a lot of things for a lot of people, and one of the things that I find wonderful about it is they create community. You can't do this alone. Um, and I, you'll meet people who come in and say, yeah, I, I'm, I don't need anybody, I can do this by myself, blah, 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 blah. And you kind of look at them and know that that path isn't going to have a great ending. Yeah. It's yeah. the sense of community. You know, it's like if you've ever gone jogging by yourself and then you go jogging with a buddy, you can jog about five more miles with that person <laughs> with you than you can by yourself because we're connecting, we're talking, we're, we're, you know, the friendship that's there. And I think that's what 12 step communities have done for each other and community does for all of us. Um, and we need it. I mean, the Turning Point Center, I think, is a small community for many people, 
But um, that's probably one of the magic formulas of recovery is community. Yeah. It's all about community. Yeah. And, and um, connecting safely. I, I mean, I think it's been alluded to uh, during our talk today that sometimes people will enter into their, their addiction already um, severely wounded, mm -hmm. um, either by adverse childhood experiences or some trauma that precedes the addiction. Exactly. And then through the course of addiction, there are additional wounds that blend with and complicate the initial wounds. Exactly. So upon abstinence, you have a person that's, that's wounded. Yeah. And, and, and many times that area of relationships is one that's become completely empty mm -hmm. over the years. But it's so, we, it's so important mm -hmm. to us to have relationships. Absolutely. So that's the idea of process again. And the idea of, I, I'm really glad you mentioned the 12 uh, step programs because that was where, where I found my, my pathway to recovery. Mm -hmm. And one of the clearest things for me was the pace at which I was ready to develop relationships was very slow, and people seemed to understand that, mm. and they seemed to provide a safe place where I could grow mm. into having relationships that I felt safe in. And after a number of months and then years, I began to really generalize that out into my entire life. And today mm -hmm. I have relationships with, with hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. and, um, but it wasn't always that way. It was a very gradual and a very important uh, process. You know, I, I, the point you make to it is that that was your process and there is no one way to mm -hmm. move in recovery. Everyone has their own path mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. helping one find that and, and finding the group of people that will support you mm -hmm. in that path is very critical too. Mm -hmm. There's no judgment about your speed or lack right. of speed or right. anything, right. and that's that's critical. What about what about that for you? Uh, community, relationships, social networks, love, hope, friendship. That's everything for me right now. Yeah. You know, I I and I'm pretty sure the National Recovery Month theme this year is stronger together. Yeah, and that's how you know I really think I've maintained this for the last seven years is. The community that I've built. Um, Gary and I were chatting before and he asked if I was still in touch with the women mm. that we planned that first walk with and that those are those are my closest people. That's wow. my closest network. Mm. Um, and I know that I couldn't be doing this alone. And it and it does go beyond the relationships of that sober living situation, um, of any sort of twelve step program. It it's it's the community that I build within my family. It's the community that I build within my um, my work relationships. And but this has taught me how to do it. Right. Exactly. So I can, I can relate a lot to what you were just sharing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another area of my life that was really fostered by um, sober living. Was you know how do I interact with people? Yeah. How do you resolve conflict? How do I connect with other people? Um, because that's a that's a, a huge issue for me. Without you know continuing to look inward and develop myself and, you know. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing that, that eventually we become mentors mm -hmm. and examples of health. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty beautiful thing. Yeah. I wanted to, um, I want to go back to the recovery walk. I want to, in, in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's something that I think is really important for us to talk about when it, when it comes to recovery. Mm -hmm. One, one of the things that, that I've noticed, and, and a lot of people, and I'm sure you have noticed it also, um, is that people with uh, severe opioid use disorder, uh, people with opioid uh, addiction, you know, are, are one of the most vulnerable populations in America today. There's no doubt about, that, mm -hmm. about it. The heroin supply is uh, contaminated with fentanyl. Just today I was at a meeting and we had a, a discussion of a young man in, in the Chittenden County who died from a, a fentanyl overdose and it was from counterfeit Xanax. So this drug is, is really taking a lot of lives in America. Yeah. So you have people with, with opioid use disorder that suffer a terrible stigma. And then you have 
people with opioid use disorder who are prescribed what's called medications for addiction treatment, methadone or buprenorphine, mm -hmm. who are exposed to like a secondary stigma, the accusation being, oh, you know, you're not really abstaining, you know, you're still using because you're on this medication. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we need to address that, mm -hmm. that, that people with opioid <clears throat> use disorder on medication for addiction treatment can also be in recovery if they meet some of the other criteria. Absolutely. Yeah, let's, let's just talk about that a little bit. Do you have people um, receiving MAT that come to the recovery center? Oh, uh, between 30 and 40 percent of our guests are, are on either Suboxone or Methadone. And what those drugs do for folks is they take the cravings away and they allow themselves, it allows them to settle down and start to focus on what they need to do for themselves, both yeah. on the health end and home and all those dimensions that we talked about. Yeah. Without that for them, um, they probably wouldn't be able to make it um, yeah. and get to that place of recovery. Yeah. Um, and I've seen <clears throat> folks uh, go from using um, those two <clears throat> drugs to um, weaning themselves off it over a period of time with the support of a doctor mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, and then and actually give it up. Um, and other people, they need to keep continuing for a long period of time. I mean, but the survival rate of folks that allow themselves to, you know, use a medically assisted treatment yep. is huge. I mean, the, yeah. the trajectory is very positive. I think it's over 50 percent that the, the, the mortality rate is cut over 50 percent with people on medication. And some of the research today is showing that it's a longer term process than was once thought. Right. And I think patients who are on MAT or medications for addiction treatment take a beating because of that. Yeah, the general do. public says, why do you need this medication for so long? Why can't you just stop? You're using on purpose. And it's not the case. Yeah. It's a medical condition with a, a medical prescription uh, supervised by medical personnel. And it has really a life saving outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, need to, we need to really recognize that. Do you have any experience with that or friends who maybe are receiving MAT? I don't have personal experience with that, mm -hmm. but I have, um, you know, su I've supported and I'm actually currently supporting another woman who, that is her, that is her path yeah. right now. It's yeah. part of her process yeah. and, um, you know, she's not stopping there. And I think that's a really great thing about the turning point mm -hmm. and really all the resources mm -hmm. in yeah. this area is yeah. that <clears throat> you can use that as part of your process and you can also use other pieces. Right. Right, so it's a valid pathway to recovery. Mm -hmm. So I, I would appeal to the, the, the to the audience, to the viewing audience, that let's get behind everyone that's seeking recovery today. Let's support people. This is a brain disease. This is not a choice. This is not a criminal behavior. This is not a weakness of character. This is a legitimate mm -hmm. disease. I think it has the same rate as. Um, a prostate cancer and diabetes too. Mm -hmm. People don't choose prostate cancer. People don't choose diabetes too. Mm -hmm. People don't choose addiction. Yep. It's a disease. We need to get behind them because the more they feel the support of the general public, the less reluctant they will be yep. to come and seek help and get help and recover. Yep. And um, before we end, I'd like to get the slides for the step into action recovery walk up again and take a look at some of the mm. faces. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can talk about, I know we talked a little bit earlier, and you talked about the reaction of the, the community mm -hmm. when we're walking down Church Street. What, what was your experience of the reaction of the, the community? It's hard to find the words, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Gary had mentioned that it started at Oak Ledge Park and now it is right at the top of Church Street. Mm. And we walk right down Church Street and it's not just people who are in recovery. It is, like Gary mentioned earlier, it's families, it's friends, yeah. Yeah. it's <clears throat> business owners who, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, feel the effects of this. And mm -hmm. as you walk down, um, people, you know, wonder, you know, who's this crew in their purple t-shirts? and <laughs> 
Um, usually there's signs and they talk about being in recovery and you see people starting to read the signs and you know they process a little and then you know they start cheering us on. Yeah. And I think a really important part of it is to see the face of recovery because all all we see I'll, I'll I'll take that back. You know, what we see quite frequently is the face of addiction, of the, yeah. is the face of people struggling, yeah. is the face of people dying. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think if you're not familiar with what the face of recovery looks like, you would be shocked yeah. because it's Absolutely. it's the your your neighbor, it's myself. It's the face of yeah. recovery. Here's the face of recovery. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Awful lot of high fives during that walk. Yes. High fives, you know, yay. You know, <laughs> keep it up, nice going, good yeah. work. It's really, really something. And that's uh, the eradication of, of stigma. People want to respond in a positive way. People have been taught the wrong things. Yeah. We need to teach yeah. them the right things. People yeah. do recover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful, beautiful. You know, if I was to say anything to the general public, it would be lower the volume on judgment and raise the volume on acceptance. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. just that simple. There you go. Um, and you, by raising the volume on acceptance, you get to know some amazing people. If Absolutely. you're judging people, <clears throat> you, you lose that opportunity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, at the at the end of the show, we will show a slide that um, has uh, the recovery walks in Vermont occurring in Vermont. Uh, at the end of the, like so, we're heading into the end of the show now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in the habit of asking um, the guests to to end the show with a, a comment to, to the viewing audience. So we we were scheduled to have. Uh, Jennifer Bayon on the show, but she couldn't appear today, so she prepared something in writing that I'll that I'll read. Jennifer is a um, she she works at the recovery center. Yep. As a peer one, support specialist. Peer support specialist, and then she also works at the Chittenden Clinic. Right. As same, a, a same peer thing support, up there. Yep. Peer support mm -hmm. specialist. So Jennifer prepared a brief statement. I'd like to read that in closing. Jennifer is a person who is uh, receiving medication for addiction treatment. Jennifer says, Matt saved my life. I was a mess and had nothing going for me. I have since rebuilt and relearned. It was definitely a process and hard work, but so worth it, with two exclamation points. Mm -hmm. I think opioid addiction is a cultural issue and we are so quick to blame the individuals using instead of targeting and addressing the problems. Medication for addiction treatment helped to address those problems in my life so I could focus on other things, like a job, housing, my family, a couple of more exclamation points. <laughs> <laughs> I like to say to people out there who might be struggling to not give up, to, I'd like to say, to people out there who might be struggling to not give up. Mm -hmm. If you slip, get back up. Mm -hmm. Also, we can't get better alone. So to families and friends, educate yourselves, ask questions, and try to understand what we are going through. It's tough for us too, and MAT can help make life livable. It's a small piece of the puzzle. Well said. Yeah, so those are words from, from Jen uh, Bayon, and I'll give you the, the camera now. I mean, it's hard to follow <laughs> that. She hit all the high points. Um, yeah, um, at some, some basic level, it's humanity here, and, and we're all equal. Um, and um, it's celebrating recovery. It's celebrating yeah. life. It's um, allowing everyone the opportunity to do that. And if communities can embrace all their citizens, no matter what their station in life at, we, we have an amazing community, amazing country. It's about time we start doing that. Yeah, all right, Gary, thank you, thank you. Yeah, that is, that is hard to follow, but I wanted to just echo the, the educate yourself. Um, I know for my own family, where 50% of the children are in recovery, that it's very much changed the perception that not just my parents and my sibling, other siblings have, but my extended family 
um, when before they might not have understood it and understood that it, it is a disease and that there are solutions, but it's also a different path for everyone. And I think that's also very important to understand is there's no cookie cutter way, you know, to recover. Yeah. Yeah. That there's gonna be stumbles and it's not gonna look perfect, um, but it doesn't mean that the person isn't fully striving for recovery. And we, we have to stick with people. Mm -hmm. we, we, we can't abandon them. We have to abandon stigma, not people. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much thank you. for being on the show. Thank you, guys. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you.